Lonnie, the way you wore your hat, the way you sipped your tea, the memory of all that. No, no, they can't take them away from me. The way you stole a scene. Films I've seen. No, no, they can't take that away from me. We will never really be apart here at LCGRT. I will always keep your name. The way you gave a twinge from Shakespeare to Bill Inch. <laughs> it was Mr. Roberts on a binge. No, no, they can't take that away from me. From Broadway to the fish kill stage and your work with Tennessee. The fond love of actors was plain to see. And the way you ran with James Dean and Kazan. Even Strasburg was a fan. No, no, they can't take them away from me. Actor, playwright, and director, you founded GRT. How much you mean to me The way your smile just beats That was the way you see
that soon. Yeah. I'm a dean, dean, and every one of you who today are our honored guests, welcome. Now, we're met today to honor and celebrate the life of a truly eclectic man, a loving husband, loving father, hell of an actor, writer, producer, director, and I might add, one of the most optimistic men I've ever known. Let's <laughs> <laughs> face it, to manage legit theater for well over 40 years, you have to have a pretty positive attitude. And on a personal note, I don't remember ever seeing Lonnie down or depressed. Lon Leonard Chaplin was born on October the 1st, 1920 in Joplin, Missouri. Second child of Elmer and Eunice Chapman. His early love of sports and athletics was soon matched by his attraction to the stage and acting. He appeared on stage for the first time in the seventh grade, and his high school years saw him, put his, saw him split his passions for running and acting. And it was during this time that he met a young girl teaching Sunday school at the Nazarene Church. <laughs> Is this too perfect? <laughs> Her name was Irma Dean Gibbons. <laughs> However, it would be a few more years before they actually began dating. Plays and relays in high school and junior college led to a track and field scholarship to the University of Oklahoma. And it was there at OU that Lonnie met his lifelong friend, Dennis Weaver. In 1941, Lonnie's education was interrupted and put on hold by the Second World War. He was the first man from the University of Oklahoma to win this. And as a Marine, he saw action in a different kind of theater, the Pacific. He saw grueling duty on Guadalcanal. And like so many of his fellow combatants, he contracted malaria, which ran was to recur periodically throughout his life. In 1944, Lottie took leave to marry his teenage sweetheart. <laughs> After the war, he completed his education at OU, graduating in 1947 with a BFA in drama. One year later, Lottie landed his first professional acting job as Wiley in the National Touring Company of Mr. Roberts. 1949 was a milestone year for Lonnie. As I mentioned previously, he joined the Actors Studio in Manhattan. It was there that he honed his craft with some of the finest actors of his generation. Lonnie was remembered as always being prepared with a scene or a monologue, always ready to step in at a moment's notice and work on his art. That year also marked Lonnie's Broadway debut in The Closing Door, directed by, Harold, uh, by Lee Strasberg. He also made his television debut in a live broadcast of the TV serial Captain Video. <laughs> and finally, 1949 saw the arrival of Irma Dean and Lonnie's son, Wiley Dean. <laughs> in the years that followed, he appeared in a distinguished list of Broadway productions, most notably as Turk in the original comeback Little Sheba. in the first revival of The Glass Menagerie with Helen Hayes and Tom in the revival of The Time of Your Life with Franchot Tone. In 1954, Lonnie made his motion picture debut in East of Eden with James Dean and Julie Harris and Raymond Massey. He followed that with a co-starring role in Young at Heart with Doris Day and Frank Sinatra. <laughs> He has since appeared in over 30 major motion pictures and has well over 300 television credits. Uh -huh. In 1955, with fellow actor Kurt Conway, he formed the Theater Studio Acting School in Manhattan. Amongst his many pupils were Martin Landau, Barbara Bain, Lou and Jim Antonio, Dustin Hoffman, Barbara Streisand, and Robert Duvall. And he and Kurt ran the school for three years. From the late 50s to the middle 60s, Lonnie headed up the Cecilwood Theater in the town of Fishkill, New York. Upstate. Cecilwood was a 360-seat uh, Equity Playhouse. 
Play would close on a Sunday. They would strike the set that night. Build on Monday, over on Tuesday, and do seven shows a week. <laughs> and it was here that Miss Streisand got her equity card, appearing in The Boyfriend. And Dustin Hoffman also appeared there for three seasons. In 1966, Lottie, Irma Dean, and Dean made the move to Hollywood and settled in Studio City. Once in Los Angeles, Lottie got right to work, directing The Glass Menagerie, The Fantastics and West, and West Side Story, and the Inner City, City Cultural Center. He also founded a West Coast branch of the Actors Studio. And in the early 70s, he heard about some actors in Hollywood who had converted a laundromat into a small theater. And, well, I think at this point I'd like to turn the afternoon over to the Group Repertory Theater's original and longest serving active member, Miss Janet. And I remember the first time I laid eyes on Lonnie. It was 1973 at that little tiny 32 seat theater on Van Ness. And we were just a group of actors doing scenes. We, we really hadn't found our direction. We were a theater in search of an artistic director. And Lonnie was an artistic director in search of a theater. So it was a perfect marriage. And Lonnie was not only a brilliant director, but he was also very smart because we were 10 actors. So he chose a play in 10 roles. <laughs> He adapted Schnitzler's Laurent, which came to be known as Round Dance, and um, we were a hit. Put us in the limelight, and pretty soon everybody wanted to join our little theater, but the space was too small, so we had to move. So Lonnie found the theater over on Magnolia. Yeah. That was a great theater. And that used to be um, a bar or a funeral parlor or both, I can't remember. <laughs> Our, our, um, my favorite play there was Company. Yay. Yeah. Yay. And BFW Lonnie, Bar. It was a what? BFW Bar. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and Lonnie directed it with such creativity that we ran over five months. Um, then the city um, decided to tear down the building. So again, Lonnie had to go out and find another space. And what he found was an old, empty warehouse. And it took about a year for it to be built into a theater, but here we are. <laughs> Lonnie gave us all the space to realize ourselves creatively. And one could never fail, only discover. So, he's touched us all, hasn't he? He profoundly touched me. And I'm going to miss him. We all are. And I'm going to miss him with a really big smile. Right. <laughs> Lonnie Chapman was a special kind of a guy. With a warm smile and a friendly personality. He always made you feel welcome and at ease and would seem to be interested in what you were saying most of <laughs> Man. In many ways, but uh, he was like us. He screwed up a, a few times, like we do every once in a while. He screwed up, and we do that in life too. Uh, he was, as I said, he was an marvelous actor, director, uh, producer, a playwright. Now, playwrights write. You can't stop them, they're addicted. Well, they're writing on top of a, an icebox or not. They, they keep writing and writing and writing. And Lonnie worked as, in his craft as a playwright. And he was, uh, he got to be pretty good at it. He, he did some good work. And the most important thing that I know about him, the thing that always awed me, was that somehow, with just a few people, he managed to keep the theater open for over 40 years. Writers, directors, producers, set designers, we all had a place to go, to work, to hold our craft, 
and the whole of the work that I'm out of town. And uh, that was no small thing. I, I never got over how the hell he did it. And of course, the greatest thing that ever happened to Lonnie was Irmady. He had no doubt about it. Everybody loves Irmany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember hearing it over and over again. And one time we had Gene Casey, who was a marvelous composer and a writer, and he came he came to a Monday night meeting and he was wearing it. He's a big fellow, we had a t-shirt on it said, But Irmadine loves me. <laughs> all the time to work hard and to, to achieve. He always challenged me. Uh, uh, and lots of times, you know, we, we uh, didn't see eye to eye. <laughs> and on those times, we were toe to toe, and nose to nose, and we had a slightly loud uh, conversation. <laughs> I mean, like uh, Tommy Lasorda and the whole play that part. <laughs> and he seemed to relish these uh, And I would always wind up uh, in the recovery room. <laughs>
I thought to get up, I, I uh, saw a body one day, I was still here right now. There's nobody who has the, the, the dignity that the body has and walk. And I did cast him. It was uh, a really remarkable experience to work with him. He was so available and so warm and so loving. Astonishing man. I had uh, I had the pleasure, by the way, of founding the Actor Studio with Marty and Marty, the Actor Studio on the West Coast. It's a privilege to be able to speak to you. I know you all love to, as did I, and we were missing as long as we were. Thank you.
are letting actors flesh out and make their own characters that had lived in your mind and found their voices on your typewriter. What a beautiful way to share your knowledge, talent, and passion. Lottie was the father figure I certainly needed, a most benevolent and non-judgmental soul, a colorful and imaginative cusser. I think her mini actually beat him on that one. <laughs> <laughs> a good fellow of a man and a Hank Williams fan. Irma Dean and Wiley Thank you for sharing it with us in this game. And I love you, Mom. I was a member here for about 15 years. I was on the board for some time and I worked with Lonnie quite a bit. You know, my dad was the type of father who would uh, tell me, well, he would never tell me that he loved me. He made me wonder whether he did, right? I mean, until one day mom told me that she would, mix, she would uh, be lying next to him at night He'd talk about how proud he was of me to the point of tears. I'm probably wrong, but I kind of think, uh, think about Lonnie being like that. Not that he should have loved me and cried or anything, but... <laughs> it's just, I mean, uh, really, I, I couldn't tell. true in Lonnie's case as it is for uh, the leader of anything really it's, there was it was competition for his affection and nobody won <laughs> nobody lost either <clears throat> he was admired and esteemed and even loved by us and that was returned by him in the form of some kind of an uh, what well, kind of an impartial respect not that he couldn't be warm, friendly, and available, he certainly was. He could be and he was. I'm not sure, but a quality of that sort is necessary in somebody who successfully runs a theater, or maybe anything of any consequence like that. It was an asset. His greatest asset, maybe, might have been his ability just to maintain this place so that would-be artists could sustain themselves, could cultivate their desires for expression, Maybe, you know, by taking risks, for example, to which they would otherwise be unlikely to take. One important instrument for this was the project, where an actor perhaps could place himself in a scene or a play as a character that he feels alienated from for one reason or another, gain self-knowledge and something of the art through the experience, and so also the critique that followed his presentation by Lonnie. Lonnie could be the epitome of the best kind of teacher one that doesn't realize he's teaching. He rather just makes observations in the moment, you know, the moment you're living in, the best of which tend to seem obvious, you know, like when Lonnie said, having an ego is okay, but an actor needs confidence because without it, he can't act. My admiration of him would make me watch him and listen to him, and my attraction to him was rooted in that curiosity I had of him. My inability to pin him down, really. <laughs> in that I, I really, I thought I couldn't really know him. He was unpredictable, and therefore infinitely interesting to me. He could be so surprising. I mean, you think about it, I never saw him, I never saw him dance, you know, or, or play a musical instrument, uh, never heard him sing, and yet he could mount, he could direct the best musical productions I've ever seen. I mean, yeah. How's that possible? <laughs> Maybe a man with so much to offer to so many who are so sensitive, and who is so much admired, may feel more vulnerable than most, and might need to, to build an emotional distance from others. For all that I, I esteemed him, loved him, while well, he remained, if not a little, at least a little bit of an enigma to me. Maybe I was so curious about him because I saw something in Lonnie that I recognized in myself, and that was a very private person in a very public profession. I miss it.
this opportunity gave me was to direct his adaptation of the book Prince. Yeah. Hey, it should have been a production, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it, he said, okay, here it is, Suzanne, it's up to you. I said, I want to make it a rock musical. I went to Sunset, and because Lonnie said, you can do anything you want if you have the passion to do it. I sat outside, whiskey a go go, and every rock that came with the synthesizer said, Hey, you want to do something for nothing? Such a great feeling of accomplishment. I did. I found a great guy who wrote the music with me, a great performance. It was a great rock version musical of the Little Prince, right? Kay, you were the rose. Where are you? <laughs> Lonnie will always be with me because what he gave me in confidence and saying, yes, you can, don't ever tell me, no, you can't, has stayed with me my entire life, through every marriage, through every <laughs> 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 It's so much, and I know he has given all of you. So he is, not, he is within me as he is within you. And Lonnie, everybody, you're still with us, baby. <laughs>
And I'm asking myself, which Lonnie am I saying goodbye to? The artistic director, the actor, the playwright, the friend, the guide, mentor, I hated the word mentor, so I used guide. And I came to the conclusion I can only say goodbye to the Lonnie I met so many years ago, too many years ago, on Magnolia, when I walked in with Al Richardson, maybe some of you remember him, and Lonnie greeted me in that special way he can, very accepting, doesn't matter race, religion, class, whatever. All you had to do was love theater and work for it. And at that time, I was a young director, a woman, not many of us around. Didn't matter to him. You want to work? Come here and work. The stage is for you. Uh, one of the things possibly that he did for me was to urge me to write for the theater. You know, we always dabble in all kinds of writing. And he encouraged me uh, to get this idea up on the stage. Bert Rosario was instrumental and helped us. Lonnie was not only encouraging with words, but he acted on what he believed. I don't know any other artistic director who would have gone to the home of a fledgling writer and worked until 3 in the morning to try to mold this rough piece into a production. We didn't carry it off, and I know it killed him to call me up and say it's not right yet. He couldn't disappoint people. He didn't like to hurt people. It was hard for him. I think a good part of the soul of Lonnie is found in his writing. Now his plays, all of his plays, weren't always successful or even understood, but he's there nevertheless. And what were they suffused with? His gentleness, his compassion for the human condition, which he spoke of often, and his poetry. He had the soul of a poet. I've been honored to benefit from Lonnie's experience and knowledge, and I also have been honored with the responsibility of preserving his legacy to us playwrights, as we know the playwrights win. I hope that I can continue to carry on the keystones of what he brought to the playwright's wing. <clears throat> Encouragement, support, and love of this stubbornly continuing and magical genre, what Lonnie loved so much, stage plays. I shall miss him, I mourn his passing, and I'll miss him as I'm sure we all will. When I think of Lonnie, I think of heart, spirit, family, and a teacher. So I always say that the best teacher is the best student. And Lonnie was definitely the best student. Not only of theater, but of life itself. The first time I met Lonnie was in 1962 in a Broadway show. And George Scott was the director. And as Lonnie would say that he thought George Scott was a, a great actor, but his direction left a little bit to be desired. <laughs> now George, what he would do is, you know, before you see him, the rehearsal scene, he would be on stage and have the person sit on the audience, and he would act out the scene. All his passion, energy. He would sit in the audience, what supposedly what? So when it came time for Lonnie's scene, he went through all his motions, that specific, dramatic. And when he was finished, he looked down to the chair of Lonnie. Was it? <laughs> Lonnie had the left. <laughs> Letting you know that certain things were unacceptable. <laughs> okay, if I may, I'd like to uh, end with uh, something I think is appropriate for Lonnie. It's a Native American prayer uh, written by Chief Yellowhawk, Sioux Chief. And uh, Great Spirit, whose voice I hear in the wind, whose breath gives life to all the world, hear me. 
come to you when you kill me. I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in beauty. Take my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make me wise so that I may know all the lessons you've taught my people, the lessons that you've hidden in every rock and every leaf. I need your strength not to be superior to my brothers and sisters or any form of life, but to be able to fight my greatest enemy, myself. Make my hands clean, my eyes clear, so that when life fades as a fading sunset, my spirit may come to you without shame. Well, now you got to be accomplished this. I tell you one thing, after we leave this planet, I don't know where we go necessarily, heaven, hell, and all those concepts. But whoever Ronnie is, I intend on joining him when I leave. <laughs>
Make your family feel like they're the most important people in your life. I love Lonnie, like many others, and will miss him dearly. And this next one is from Carl Malden, who I spoke to on the phone. He's 95 and doing well. <laughs> um, when I first saw Lonnie Chapman at the Actors Studio, I saw a young man filled with hope, love, and a little bit of terror. <laughs> Many years passed, and lo and behold, we were both cast in Baby Doll. And this time, Lonnie was still filled with love and hope, but something had been added, total confidence. We loved working with him, and we loved him. He will be missed by many. And this is from a former member, Lynn Rosen, who, uh, who lives in Michigan, and she now teaches children how to act. And I'm told to do this first part in a southern accent. <laughs> a woman came, comes home from her checkup at, at the doctor, and she's very excited. She brags to her husband, honey, the doctor said that I have the bosom of a 20-year-old woman. And the husband, half listening, replies, oh, and did he say anything about your 60-year-old ass? <laughs> <laughs> and after a short pause, the wife replies, no, we never even mentioned your name. <laughs> because my memory of Ermadine telling it <laughs> is unforgettable. <laughs> and because in commemorating Lonnie Chapman, you cannot leave out Ermadine Chapman because as we all know, it would be like the Oreo without the cream. <laughs> Ermadine, you are indeed the cream that has always held the cookie together. We all love you not only for your good humor, but your gracious willingness to share your life and Lonnie with all of us for so long. Many of us here today are sitting with people we have loved as long as 30 years and some as short as 30 minutes in the life group. <laughs> Except that we, members of the Lonnie Chapman Theater, Theater, the GRT, we are a family. Some of us stay forever, some of us go, some of us become famous, some of us become everything else. Yeah. <laughs> but like all families, we have seeds planted here in the exploration of ourselves and to craft and the finding of ourselves within that craft. This past week at my office far away, it gelled just what the lesson was for me and probably for many of us. The one genuinely priceless jewel that Lonnie gave us, not by lecturing about it, perhaps not completely conscious of it, but certainly by example. Lonnie stood, and he shined a light down the avenue of mediocrity and failure, which he knew is the only true path to genuine creativity <laughs> and brilliance. He understood the supreme importance of allowing and nurturing, even repeating and reveling in mistakes, failure, and truly bad theater. <laughs> and not just one or two genres, but everything. Modern Shakespeare, classic poems recited while burlesque, babes dance. Whatever we gaggled at and could not understand the point of, Lonnie allowed, no encouraged. He said with his actions, this is the stage, just keep getting on it, read what you're wrong for, try what might be absurd. And I find myself teaching the same thing to my children as they go through the stages of their lives. It is the beauty and the brilliance of the path itself that Lonnie lit. And I, for one, will be forever grateful. Because I know that if I didn't see and perform and write and direct and share all those spectacularly flawed moments here, in the safety of Lonnie's non-judgmental presence, I wouldn't know the value of the great moments when I saw them or finally had them myself. Lonnie actually made me a better person as well, as well as a more talented one, showing me, showing us the true meaning of the word 
process. And by extension, showing us the brilliant process of simply living every day as best we can, okay to stumble in the ongoing effort to get it right. Thank you again, Armageddon <coughs> Dean, for letting us all be part of your family and for being a part of ours here at the GRT. Rest gently, Lonnie. We love you. I want to talk about one aspect of Lonnie's life, a big part of Lonnie's life that really hasn't been mentioned at all. Lonnie was a very, very big sports fan. <laughs> and did you ever notice that he bring every time there was a production, he bring an Umbridge to the theater, Umbridge would run the house, and <laughs> at the after intermission, he'd take Umbridge home. Where did Lonnie go? He was in his car. He was in his car. He was in his car. I went to see Lonnie at the convalescent hospital once, and I, I walked in, and he was he had just gotten away, and uh, I wasn't sure whether he knew who I, who I was, I think he did, but he said, uh, um, who's winning the game? <laughs> so I said, what game? He said, any game. <laughs> The other thing I want to say is that for a number of years I had a fundraiser, I ran a basketball pool, the NCAA pool basketball pools, you know, a lot of the offices do that. Okay, every people put in money, half the money went to GRT and half the money would go to the winner. Okay. Lonnie entered every year. Every year he he entered his, and you know how many times he won? He never won! <laughs> the line never won, he always picked the Oklahoma team. <laughs> Cradle 